Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sprint 229 review. This was a normal two-week sprint. Let's get started. I'll start with the overview, Jeffrey on the UI, Adam on providers, and Joe on the platform. Uh, as you can see, it was a pretty normal sprint, similar to last time with 75 PRs merged this sprint. Uh, and an even mix between uh, enhancements and bugs. And over to Jeffrey on the UI. Hey, uh, in Sprint 229, a total of 31 PRs got merged into the UI classic repository, out of which six are related to bug fixes, uh, seven for en enhancements, 11 for technical depths, and seven others. I can explain about them in the following slides. So there was an error in the uh, VM server relationship forms API. A variable that uh, contains a record ID was different from what it was supposed to be. Uh, Gilbert identified this and uh, passed in the uh, passed in a correct variable name to the React component and the issue got solved. Next slide. Uh, earlier, we encountered an error in the container provider form where the host name had blank spaces, causing the validations to fail. And in the last sprint, we addressed this issue by trimming the unwanted spaces from the field. Uh, however, this resolution led to another problem. As you can see in the screenshot, the endpoints were expected to be an array. Uh, but it returned an object. So uh, David refactored this code and added appropriate test cases to resolve this issue. Next slide. Uh, this PR is from Keenan to display the VMs that are avail available to the customers. Next slide. A uh, few summary pages had uh, blank entries like you see here in the variable block. Uh, this could have been a regression from the uh, restructuring of the MIQ structured list component that we did before. So uh, David made a few changes in the table list view component to solve this issue. Next slide. The uh, fix task details page PR is from Gilbert uh, fixing the uh, task details page, uh, which failed to load for the non-workers task. Next slide. This is another PR from Keenan to add the R back to switches and VLANs. So this is visible in the VLANs dropdown in the reconfigure VM screens. Next slide. Uh, in the uh, request logs feature under the service for the administrators, a lot of additional information is printed, which the user doesn't really need to see. Uh, so an issue was created to enable, disable these request logs uh, view depending on the roles a user has. So as an enhancement, David addressed this issue by adding uh, adding the MIQ request show logs feature to the view page of uh, the request page. Next slide. Gilbert converted the settings task tab to React. Uh, next slide. Uh, the embedded automates uh, simulation results were initially rendered in Rails and uh, we converted them to React by introducing a new component and uh, migrated the tabs and their contents to a new to this new con uh, component. So during this process, we uh, saw something like an XML holder in one of the tabs, and that was transformed into a new React component and later got embedded into the MIQ structured list component. Next slide. The uh, orchestration template summary page was converted from HTML to React uh, by AML. Next slide. Uh, this enhancement PR is from Gilbert, uh, converting the browser confirmation box to a React model in the uh, dashboard page. So this is seen when you try to remove a widget uh, from uh, one of the dashboard which in the dashboard page. Next slide. Uh, the style improvements uh, the style of the dual list component seen in the catalog items form was improved a bit. Uh, the alignment of few of the components were off margin before. Next slide. A similar style fix was attempted in the tax modification component to uh, reduce a lot of white, white space over here. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Gilbert identified a lot of codes and files which remained unused, mostly after uh, certain pages were converted to React components. So this cleanup involves the removal of HTML files uh, from modules like uh, auth credentials, multi-taps, uh, log collections, schedule, and provider pages. He also removed a lot of unused methods and the tabs that is not being used. Next slide. Uh, for other PRs, uh, Gilbert fixed the uh, GTL Cypress helper functions and updated the do their documentation. He uh, moved the codes for the Cypress search box assertion from the command folders to the assertion folder. 
Uh, he also updated the yarn.log with the latest dependencies. Uh, Gilbert also fixed the Cypress Explorer helper function to open it into a new panel in the Explorer view. And uh, Joe updated a few UI translation JSON files. He also updated the Rails 7 gem in the gem spec file. And uh, Joe also normalized the string to proper capitalization in the application controller's Explorer file. Uh, that's all from the UI side. Over to Adam for providers. Thanks, Jeffrey. For providers this sprint, we fixed a bug with uh, Ansible Tower and AWX where jobs that were being run uh, as orchestration stacks were being linked back to the uh, playbook as an orchestration template ID. Uh, this was causing issues if you had an actual record with that ID in the orchestration templates table and was causing issues where you couldn't destroy seemingly random providers because uh, Ansible Tower jobs were being incorrectly associated to that. So what we did was we added a new uh, foreign key to track that relationship properly and uh, data migration to clean up the incorrect values that were being linked. So that should no longer be a problem. For Flow, uh, we a while ago added not a bunch of non-blocking calls that had a default timeout of five seconds. We changed the default to block indefinitely, um, since if you don't take any action, uh, you'd expect that it would uh, wait as opposed to having to add code to handle retries. Uh, so we now uh, block indefinitely now by default. We also added a pull policy option to the Docker runners. Uh, so for Kubernetes, you can specify uh, always, missing, etc. Uh, Podman has a pretty cool one, which is called uh, Newer, which is what we're going to default to uh, going forward for appliances. Uh, Keenan added some convenience options to the CLI so that you can pass just, um, for example, dash dash Kubernetes instead of having to spe spell out the entire Docker runner uh, options command. And we fixed a bug if the workflow credentials is uh, nil. It was causing issues when you were trying to set credentials as part of a uh, state output. Next slide. For workflows, uh, some more uh, nil workflow uh, credential column issues. So the um, first one fixed if the credential column was nil being passed in, we were defaulting to an empty hash. And then the second one uh, resolved an issue if you're trying to set credentials when there weren't any map credentials already. So just uh, some bugs that got knocked out from the uh, adding that feature in the last uh, sprint or two. For workflow examples, uh, Jason added a GitHub action to build and push the container images as soon as there are any changes to them, and also fixed an issue where the managed IQ API client wasn't being required, which was causing one of the examples to fail to run. Next slide. And we should have, uh, yep, so we have a demo from Nasser about the Kafka work uh, and the non-Rails event worker. Uh, that was merged last sprint. So we have a good demo here. Hey, everyone. In this demo, we'll be going over some of the new changes that will be introduced regarding performance and resource improvements. We will now be using Kafka as the default messaging, and this allows us to do a couple of things, one of which is the introduction of non-Rails workers. Non-Rails workers are performant because they are lightweight as they do not require loading in a Rails environment. So for the initial phase, we are only supporting this for the VMware infrastructure provider event catcher, but the long-term plan is to introduce this for all workers. And so here we've already added a VMware infrastructure provider. The non-Rails worker functionality is controlled by a single setting as shown here. And the VMware infrastructure event catcher will be set to a non-Rails worker by default moving forward. So here at the appliance console, something important to note is that it is now required for messaging to be configured when configuring an appliance. For more details on that, you can refer to the documentation. So just to verify that the event catcher is pushing events to our Kafka topic, we can set up a consumer as follows. And we see here that the events are successfully pushed into our Kafka topic. Lastly, we will be doing a performance comparison between the Rails and non-Rails workers. So first, we will start off with the Rails VMware event catcher by enabling it in the settings. And then we can see the memory being used by inspecting the worker. 
and we see that the Rails worker is using around 266 megabytes of memory. Next, we will switch the event catcher back to the non-Rails variant, which is what we will be using as the default moving forward. And we see that the non-Rails worker is using around 80 megabytes of memory. As you can see, there is a significant improvement and reduction in memory usage when we go from the Rails worker to the non-Rails worker. And we look forward to introducing more non-Rails workers in the future. Thank you for watching. Hey everyone, in this demo we'll be... There we go. All right, and that's it for providers, over to Joe. Thanks, Adam. For platform enhancements and improvements this sprint, Nassar moved the orchestrator root certificate to the projected volume source, and that should enable mounting multiple certificates. Uh, next, Keenan improved Bundler Inject to allow developers to specify um, multiple overridden gems, such as in a, all of them in the same directory, instead of specifying the full path on each one. Uh, next, I had several RHEL 7 pull requests to allow standalone gems to be testable with RHEL 7. Next, I made some RPM build improvements by excluding some unnecessary files that get included in the RPMs and by also using a much faster version of BRP strip, which is used for stripping binaries. Uh, next, we merged uh, updated translations coming back from the translators. Adam added back parallel tests as we can greatly improve developer test time with more CPU cores and multiple configured databases. And finally, Brandon updated the operator SDK. Next slide. For platform bugs, Brandon added Ansible Core 2.12.7, which uh, since they were removed from the CentOS repos. Uh, next, I bumped the Puma version to address the CVE. And Nassar added the manage IQ user to the disk group. So it can allow iSCSI smart state scans. Um, since previously we were running as root, now that we're running as manage IQ, we needed to do this step. Next slide. All right, and that's it for the Sprint 229 review. Our next review, Sprint 230, will be on February 7th at the usual place and time. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the presenters today, all the contributors, and our entire community. Thanks, everyone.